So I'm titling today's message, The Apostate. You know that Paul warned us clearly in the book of Thessalonians that before the Antichrist would come into the world, he told us that there would first be a falling away of the church. Now that's easily read and it's easily seen. It's in context. It's very clear and it's very simple. Paul said that there would be a falling away of the church. Now when you see the word falling away in the Bible, that is the Greek word apostasy. What Paul was saying was there would be apostates and apostasy taking place in the church in the last days. Warning that many has crept into the church unaware. They spread their lying false doctrines. You believe it. You then sooner or later fall into apostasy because you are following the apostate's message, you understand? The Bible says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they, they who, the ones we just talked about, crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. There is nothing clearer than that. That if you have been partakers of the Holy Ghost, been enlightened to the Holy Ghost, partake, none of those things can you do without that you are saved. You're not going to be a partake. God's not going to partake with you. You ain't going to partake with him if you ain't born again. You're not going to see the light of the glorious gospel if you're not in him. You're not going to be enlightened by him if you're rejecting him. All of these things are the... Uh, characteristic traits and the qualities of a saved human being. They have tasted. They have partaken. They have been a part. They have accepted. And if they shall fall away to renew them again. Going back to what Paul said about the church, first there would be a falling away before the Antichrist would come. The falling away means apostate, apostasy. This word here is the same word he uses in Hebrews, if they shall fall away. Now, the word they shall fall away means commit apostasy. Because as the church and as the believer, there is only one sin that you can commit that causes you to be an apostate. And that is you must be saved to commit this sin. No unbeliever, no rejecter can ever be guilty of the sin of apostasy. This is talking about people who has it and if they shall fall away go into apostasy they shall never be renewed again because they bring Christ to an open shame so the scriptures is very clear on this now apostasy in short is this apostasy is the willful rejection of Jesus Christ that is after you received Christ after I've preached Christ, after I've served Christ and proclaimed him to be the one, the son of the living God, if I shall now deny him, it is apostasy. It is a rejection of Christ by those who was once Christians. Those who have voluntarily and consciously abandoned their faith. They left Christianity for something else. The struggle in the war in the book of Galatians, all six chapters, was that the Galatians was being tested and tried by Jews who was coming into the church at Galatia, bringing in the law, saying that you have to observe these things of the law or you, you can't be right with God. And Paul told them clearly that if you return into the law, you will fall in from grace. They will have to accept now either the law or Christianity. The church at Galatia is saved and they're now being presented with a false doctrine and Paul is saying the only way you can receive that what they're telling you is to reject Christ. That is what apostasy is. So I want to address those that feel great fear that you have sinned and hopefully may be able to put it together where it's clearly understood and we won't live in that uh, fear anymore. Uh, let's take for an example Judas Iscariot and Peter. 
Y'all remember the sins of both of these. Judas Iscariot denied, didn't only deny, but Judas Iscariot betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about it for just a moment. Here is a man who partook with Jesus, just like Simon Peter did. He was there in the boat when Jesus walked on the water. He was there with them when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He was there with them when he saw Jesus spit in the sand, rub it in a blind man's eye and a man's up. Simon, uh, Judas Iscariot knew who Jesus was. But for whatever it was that motivated him, and of course it was a demon, but whatever physical or mode of thinking it was that motivated Judas to not deny Jesus, but betray him. He took the gospel, so to speak. He took the Lord Jesus Christ and willfully handed him over to the enemy. That is Judas departing from the Lord. He willfully took the Lord Jesus. He willfully took the Bible. He willfully took salvation. He willfully took the gift of which he was enlightened with, and he willfully gave it to the enemy. That is how come he was not motivated to repent. He had left it already. You can't do that. You understand? You can't surrender, turn over the Lord Jesus Christ to the enemy and with any place whatsoever in your heart still be with him. He had already turned Christ over in his heart before he did it physically. He had already planned it before he did it. And we know he got money for it. So he exchanged Christ for something else. And therefore God counted him as an apostate because he was an apostate. Judas Iscariot had fallen away and once a Christian or a believer falls away, the Bible makes it absolutely clear, you cannot get back in. It's over. Now, you put that alongside what Simon Peter did. Simon Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a terrible thing to do. But there is some reasonable and logical explanation for what Peter did. Peter never faced a moment that he had given Jesus up in his heart. At the time that the gun is pointed to your head, you might say, I don't know him. This act of the flesh because of fear or whatever the case may be. But in Simon Peter's heart, he never surrendered Jesus over to him, never delivered Jesus over to an enemy. He never plotted nor planned on betraying. He never plotted and planned beforehand on denying the Lord. It was a spur of the moment thing. It was a life or death situation. He was there because he loved the Lord. But when the enemy caught him and he came to the test, he came weak in the flesh and he committed an error. He committed a sin. He committed a bad sin. But sins is something that the Lord Jesus is a master at forgiving and forgetting if the heart is right and remains right and when it messes up it comes back now the simple fact of the business is brothers and sisters all of us may find ourselves in some kind of a bind or tight spot in life whatever it may be we may for a moment weaken to the flesh who hadn't and who won't God knows this that's why the Bible says that there's sins not unto death and any sin that is unto death, that we, because we're not apostates, we still love the Lord. I didn't go out and do what I did because I wanted to kill Jesus. I did what I did because I'm a human being and I got weak and I done something I shouldn't have done. I'm gonna come back now and I'm going to repent as Peter did, which then means in repentance covering the ground that you're not gonna do it anymore. If you truly repent it of something, it means you don't want it anymore. It means you're not going to do it anymore. You can't repent of something, go straight back out, do it again. Then repent of it and go straight back out and do it again. Then repent of it, go straight back out and do it again. The heart ain't right. You see what I'm saying? God is 
the reader of the heart. This is how come the Bible says that God judgeth by the heart. Amen. The heart is what carries the motive. Wherever the motive is, that's what you're going to be judged for. God knows what you're really up to. There's a difference in your mouth and your heart. God ain't going by your mouth. You ain't going to deceive God, brother. Your mouth ain't going to deceive God because God's bypassing your mouth and looking straight at your heart. And what you really are is in your heart and what you're really doing is in your heart. And that's what he's reading. That's why he judgeth a man by his heart. Amen. In, 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 in Peter's heart, he never meant no harm to Jesus. In Judas Iscariot's heart, he did mean harm to Jesus because he knew what was going to happen when he turned him over. That's the difference between a Christian that sins and an apostate, one who tasted and has fallen out. That is the reason why he cannot get back in. Once he was there, now he has willfully left God. And God now, in response, has willfully left him. It's over. Your heart's desire to ever come repent for what you did wrong will not be there. You don't care anymore. So I tell you, this is one of the ways that you'll always know that you've not gone too far. Is if you still care. When you become an apostate, it don't matter to you anymore because God ain't in you no more. Amen. Then there is the issue of Esau in the Bible. Esau and Jacob. The Bible tells us that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible tells us that Esau found no place for repentance. So you're looking at a man here who lost it, and the Bible clearly tells us he lost it with no way back. What did he do? The birthright was given to Esau. He was the oldest. The birthright was symbolic in his service to God and to God's people. A servant is not somebody who's supposed to be privileged in all of this. A servant is a servant. He is to serve God's people. And that's what the birthright represented. Pretty much a servant of God for the purpose of God to serve God's people. Esau was a man who didn't just go out and commit a sin or do wrong. But Esau took the birthright, say the Bible, the gospel. He took the birthright and gave it away to Jacob for what? A bowl of soup. What did he do to the birthright? He willfully gave it up. He willfully turned it over to feed his flesh for one day. That tells you he had reached a place that the birthright meant nothing. It certainly didn't mean more to him than a bowl of soup. That tells you that the man's heart was no longer with God, no longer to serve God's purpose. His heart was gone. Then the Bible tells us of King David. Now, brothers and sisters, King David was proclaimed to be, as we've talked many times before, the Bible said that David was a man after God's own heart. Now, that's quite a statement. But even after David committed his terrible sin that we're familiar with, even after David committed his terrible sin, God himself said of David, even after that, he is a man of my own heart. What did David do as, say, a Christian, a believer, one walking with God? What did he do? Well, you know what he did. He saw a beautiful woman. He lusted after her. And because he could get her, he got her. But then he had to cover himself. And so he called the man's, the woman's husband home from the battle so that they would spend time together and do what man and wife does. And so it would hide the issue now. 
whenever she became pregnant, her husband would think that it was his. He's plotting, he's scheming now to protect himself from the consequences of his sin. But whenever he looked at the woman, David's heart was not, I'm going to leave God for this. I'm going to turn God over to his enemies for this. It was the flesh doing what the flesh does, reaping the consequences of the sins that we commit, and we do reap them. There are consequences to what you do for every sin you commit. If it is well disguised, if it is well hid, you do not, you do not get it out of your head. The attempt to cover it up, run from it, and hide from it is one of the miserable things that takes place. So David committed these terrible sins. But David's heart was never at a state of apostasy. He repented of his sin. And he didn't do those things ever again in the Bible. But he continually paid the price. Take the prodigal son for an example. Then take David and take Simon Peter, the two we've used today. The prodigal son left the father's house. He didn't turn the father's house over to his enemies. He left his father's house. He thought that he could go out and make his life and live free and be happy and, and, and all of these things. And, and it's a mistake. You're not going to benefit by doing this particular thing, but you think you can. And you leave thinking that you can still keep your commitments to God and all of those things, but you just want to go out and live your own life. You just want to go out and be free. You want to get away from all the restraints and all of that. You don't hate your mom and your daddy. You want to get out from under their rule. You got some oats to sow. And you want to go do your thing. You don't want mom and daddy over your shoulder anymore. So you leave home. Thinking you're going to go now. Fly and be free. You don't hate your mama. You don't hate your daddy. You hadn't turned your mama over to an enemy, your daddy over to an enemy. You've not wished death upon them. You've not destroyed, hurt, nor harmed. It's a thing you've decided to do yourself. The prodigal son made it all the way, as you're well familiar. The prodigal son from the father's house made it all the way to the pig pen. Y'all know the story. It seemed for a moment that you was being rewarded for your decision, like Israel. Remember when they went in to Egypt? They were first rewarded, and it seemed like they was doing great. Well, that's a trick of the devil. It's how he does. It's what he does. He'll make your initial steps into sin seem like and feel like you have made the right move 100%. See how everything's falling your way? But the higher you go, brother, the farther you can fall. And you better remember that. The prodigal son lived righteously, did all the things we do, winded up now without anything, ended up in a pig pen. Now the pig pen for a Jew meant altogether something than a pig pen for me and you. A pig pen for me and you is dirty, unclean, and nobody would want to live in it. To a Jew, it was synonymous with being demon-possessed. It's as low as you could go. Pig's the lowest thing in the Jews' eyes. So this prodigal son found his way to the pig pen. He is not forsaken his God. God, his father he left, had not forsaken him. The door was still open for the prodigal son. It meant the father's heart was still open. The father's heart was not open. The door was not open anymore for Judas Iscariot. He became an apostate and impossible to renew him again. So Simon Peter, you could say he was a prodigal son. King David, 
You could say he was a prodigal son. The many other prophets and great men of the Bible that for a moment wandered astray or made a bad choice or a bad decision at a particular time, of which they paid for, did not willfully put God away. So, the point is this. We all sin. We all miss the mark. And sometimes we fall into what the Bible refers to as even sins of death. You can read of those sins of death in the book of Romans chapter 1. It'll list them, basically all of them there for you. The sins of death. But even if we fall into the sins of death, it simply means if we continue to do that, continue to walk in that way, continue to move in that way, then of course as we move in that direction, our hearts will grow harder and harder because, because you sin, God hadn't left you, God's still dealing with you. Because you've even committed a sin of death, a death penalty sin. God has not left you. God is going to whip you now. God's going to chasten you now. God may even go so far as turn you over to Satan, the Bible says. That Satan destroys your flesh. That your soul might be saved. God ain't trying to get rid of you. The cross proves to us he's trying to get you in. Amen. He ain't looking for the first mess up to throw you away, get rid of you. Even if we commit sins of death, Repentance is always our way back because even whenever a Christian commits a sin of death, the door is open to the prodigal son should he decide to come home. The problem is, is that the more we stay in those sins, the more God deals with us. Well, every time that God deals with us over a matter and we reject him, by nature, our own hearts grows harder. You have to harden yourself. Just a little bit. You don't want to feel that pull on your conscience again. So you harden yourself a little bit. Then the next time God deals with you, and you say no, and you continue in the death penalty sins, of which you know are death penalty sins, you harden yourself a little bit more. So as we go on down the line, if it continues long enough, and God continues to call, you finally get to a place to where you go deaf to his calling, and God finally reaches a place where he's not calling you anymore. You have now willfully walked off from the gospel by the hardening of your heart. The prodigal son never left his father. He was getting close. That's what the pig pen represented. The father never left him because the boy, even in all of the mess leading him to the pig pen, the boy's heart was still not against God and God's heart not against him. God is not sending anybody after him, but God has the doors wide open. If you decide to come home, the doors are open. But the only thing, the only ticket, a Greyhound ticket ain't going to get you here. A Delta ticket ain't going to fly you here. The only ticket going to get you back from where you are in the pig pen now, the only ticket that is available to get you from there back to here is called repentance. And repentance being that thing that is not only words that I'm sorry I got caught, not words that I'm sorry I'm having to pay the penalty. It is I'm sorry I have offended you, what you expect out of me. I have wronged you, Father and I am sorry for this thing I did, and I repent of it, meaning I put it down, that I may return to you. You put it down, there's something still calling in your heart. Because your flesh will never condemn you or bring you to this place of conscious awareness. Your flesh will never do that. Your flesh is getting what your flesh wants. Satan will never convict you for the wrongs that you are doing. Your flesh won't. Satan won't. That means if you're under conviction for what you're doing, there ain't but one thing in the universe bringing the conviction upon you, and it's God, and he's bringing the conviction on you because the doors are still wide open for you to come back if you were just under the conviction 
repent of whatever it is he's telling you you need to let this go you say i let it go father in the name of jesus and the doors are wide open hallelujah the bible makes it absolutely clear that a christian can lose his salvation but for a christian to lose his salvation he must go into the state of apostasy